Good morning, church. We're going to get started as people come in and shake the frost off. My goodness, it went straight from, uh, from summer to like fall winter. It got cold in a hurry. But let's go ahead and stand as we start our time of worship together this morning. It's a fifth Sunday, so it's youth Sunday, so you'll see teens at the doors, teens helping with offering, teens helping with worship. Um, and it's just an opportunity for us to say thank you to them for, um, for using the gifts that God's given them. And we're going to start with Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like clouds before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around me, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever bless. Well, spring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou art Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other. Lift us to the joy divine. Here we go, church. Mortals join the mighty chorus, which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music lifts us onward in the triumph song of life. Amen, church. Yeah. Go ahead and have a seat. Good morning, church. What a wonderful day to come and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. And we get to celebrate the many gifts that God has given us, the many different kinds of people that worship here at First Baptist Church. And uh, what a wonderful time it is to be able to do that. So as the weather changes, we know that our God does not change. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, why don't we spend some time greeting one another, saying hi, and spending a little time in fellowship. Would you stand up and greet some people around you?
All right. Ooh, that's on. Hello. Go ahead and stay standing. We're going to do our verse of the month together, read from the Word of God together. We're out of the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. So we get to say the address, where it's found, and then we'll say the verse together, and then where it's found again. Are you ready? Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. All right, I've got to go ahead and have a seat. I've got some teens that are going to help with announcements this morning. Good morning and welcome, welcome to church this morning. I'm glad to see you all here. Uh, we have yellow communication cards in the pews. Please fill one out and leave it in your seat if you are a visitor or if you have prayer requests. Please be fair, sure to stop by the information booth if you are a first-time visitor. We will give you a free gift, and we'd also like to talk to you. And we have Harvest Home, which will be celebrated Sunday, October 13th. We will be hearing from some of our missionaries about how the Lord is working throughout the world, and the morning service will be followed by a potluck in the fellowship hall. There will be no Sunday school that morning, because we like food. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a brief business meeting after the service on October 6th to approve Tegan Sears for membership, followed by the right hand of fellowship for new members. And please read your bulletin for more information. There's a lot of stuff in there. And now uh, Pastor Shaw has an announcement. It's always appropriate to say thank you to anyone who serves. Sometimes it's even more appropriate to express our thanks in a public way, and uh, we want to do that this morning because of personal sacrifice, faithfulness, and length of service. Jack Pickens and his wife, Angeline, have served as caretakers and hosts at Worm Lake Camp for 29 years. During those years, yes. During those years, they've not just done the work, they've carried the emotional load of caring for the camp. And that's uh, a 24-7, 365 responsibility. They've spent most of the summer at camp during those years, working tirelessly and sacrificially to be sure that the camp was safe and accommodating to campers and renters. Angeline has also served through the years as junior girls camp director and camp program director and has trained others to assume those positions. And you know, they've been doing this so long that Angela was actually still uh, working at the public school during the school year and then spent her summers at camp, so she didn't really get a break at all. In addition to the Pickens have personally provided winter storage for camp vehicles and equipment and arranged for or personally completed necessary maintenance. While it might be possible to calculate the financial value of their years of service, as difficult as that might be, it's not possible in this life to calculate the spiritual value of changed lives made possible through the ministry of Worm Lake Camp. Even though they have now officially retired from full-time summer service, they are still making themselves available as volunteers in the future as they are able to assist advise, and serve. On behalf of campers, staff, rental groups, Orida Conservative Baptist Churches, and the camp board, again we say, thank you and God bless you.
Thank you so much. Jeff Antosh is our Worm Lake Camp Board Chairman, and he'd like to make a presentation to the Pickens at this time. So I will, uh, I will not ask you guys to come up. We'll just, we'll just honor you where you are. Um, but it's my privilege on behalf of the past, present, and future camp boards of Warm Lake Camp uh, to present Jack and Angeline Pickens with a Faithful Service Award. And the award reads as follows. <laughs> Sorry, I know there are some funny pictures. We have some great video of them dancing off and on through the years. So it says, presented to Jack and Angeline Pickens for 29 years of faithful service on behalf of the Kingdom of God and the Ministry of Warm Lake Bible Camp. We would like to welcome you to attend any events at Warm Lake Bible Camp, any of our camps, without charge. So again, on behalf of, of the camp board's past, present, and future, thank you so much. And Angeline, I do have to say, I will make sure there's plenty of bleach at the camp. <laughs> thank you. Well, I want to, uh, before we take our offering this morning, um, talk a little bit about the giving for the fall, because as we get towards this uh, latter part of the, of the giving year, there's a number of opportunities for you to be able to give. And so um, there's just a couple of things we wanna, wanna tell you about so that you're prepared and can have an idea of what's coming up. October is Pastor Appreciation Month, but while we have greatly appreciated your generosity and notes of encouragement in the past, this year we're asking that as a congregation that we focus on several specific giving opportunities. So please consider a generous donation for Christmas gifts for our missionaries, and that would be during Harvest Home. So Harvest Home is a time where we, through the month of October, we collect gifts for our missionaries, we gather them, and we, by the end of the month then, we take them and we divide those up between our missionaries and send them out so that they have a Christmas bonus, a Christmas gift to help bless them through the year. Then. Um, Starting October 6th, Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes will be available in the lobby. Please consider filling one or more shoeboxes with your family um, or growth group or Sunday school class. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to, to give to kids as well as there's a gospel tract in there and um, an opportunity for the people that share those boxes to share the gospel. Also, we have Emmanuel's Child. It, uh, this is a Christmas tree that will be appearing in the next few weeks out in the foyer. Um, take a star from it and a $25 will provide a gift and an evangelical outreach for a Russian child. So that's a very specific ministry for Russian children, $25 for that. that go, that'll be going on throughout the next few months. Uh, but then in December, you'll have the opportunity to donate staff or Christmas gifts if, if you'd like to do that. So just would appreciate our focus on um, uh, outreach and ministry and where that can go. And I just want to appreciate all of your giving. You're such a giving church, and uh, you have blessed many people through that. Thank you. Well, speaking of, this is the time for our offering, and the youth are going to collect our offering this morning, and, but as we do, we want to make sure that we are giving with a cheerful heart, so let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning and the goodness with which you have ministered to our hearts because you have given us the grace that comes through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have changed us. You have made us new. You have regenerated us. You have... Um, turned our hearts in a new direction, Lord, and, and we want to make sure that as we live for you, Father, that um, we continue to walk in your love. Lord, um, your love has changed us to desire grace and truth, and I pray, Lord, for that balance in our lives, that um, sometimes we lean a little too heavy on, on grace, but not the truth, and I pray, Lord, that we would look to your word in a deeper way this week so that we may be sure that we are holding to your standards. But Lord, sometimes that we spend a little bit too much of a focus on truth and not on grace. And uh, Lord, sometimes we are heavy hitting, sometimes we are hard hitting, sometimes we don't give the love of Christ as we give the truth of Christ. And so Lord, I pray that we would have the, the balance that Jesus had of perfect grace and perfect truth so that we may be able to reach this world for Christ. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, amen.
Those are some brave teens. Thank you, Merrick. Uh, um, we moved up here whenever I was uh, entering into the seventh grade, and we shared last week. Pastor Darrell was my Sunday school teacher. Loved it. Um, and then we used to have the modesty rails up here on the stage, and there was, there was a choir loft kind of thing. And my mom says, you're singing in the choir. I was like, oh, not up in front of people. No. Yes, you are. And here we are. <laughs> It's awesome because, yeah, I love, I love the legacy in this church. And I love that uh, I saw a neat deal on a sign at Greenleaf this last week doing the chapel over there. And it said, um, a, a strong church, a growing church is one that remembers the past and has a vision for the future. And I pray that, that we remember um, and but that we also look forward to seeing what God is going to do for us. This first song is called Just As I Am. Would you stand with us and sing as we begin our, our continue our worship? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me call to thee, O Lamb of God, I call, I call. Just as the lamb that would be slain. Father, thank you for the, the assurance that we have in you, that you are ours, that we are yours, that we get to come here and experience your glory divine this morning. In your precious name, amen. This next song is Blessed Assurance, and I don't know if you've had the chance. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about discipleship today and, and families and children um, and teens. If you haven't had a chance to see the new um, animated version of Pilgrim's Progress, they did a wonderful job. And this is one of the songs that's at the beginning and at the end of that, that, um, 
version. And so it's fun because my kids just started singing along. And I'm like, hey, we've got that song on Sunday. Here we go. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. our worship or our singing with show us Christ hopefully we can we can remember why we're here it's not just it's Sunday let's go to church (laughs) it's an opportunity to come together as the body of Christ or those that are seeking Christ and find him here not a performance not just uh, a, a chance to to come inside out of the cold but to spend time in God's word to see his glory this morning prepare our hearts oh God Prepare our hearts, O God, help us to receive, break the hard and stony ground, help our unbelief, plant your word.
soften our hearts, that we would come with contrite hearts, humble hearts, Father, and just enjoy spending time together this morning, all broken vessels, all sinners in need of a Savior, all in need of your grace, and we come in hope of your everlasting kindness to us this morning, in your precious name, amen, amen. You may be seated, and the kids are dismissed for Children's Church. Hello? Hey, it works. That's, it's strange, like the safety from behind a stand and a guitar, just three feet forward, it's a lot of difference. Whoa. But thank you for the opportunity for the teens to be able to minister. Um, it, it takes a lot of courage, and it takes um, the opportunity of them standing together and working together. <clears throat> I had the opportunity on Saturday morning um, some of the teens had a cross-country meet, and, excuse me, <coughs> that didn't do a very good job of covering that mic. Um, yeah, of, uh, my son was running, and then his friend, who didn't have to run, jumped in and ran the entire 3K with him. And, yeah, that was my thought, too. I'm like, oh, that's, that's a friend right there. That's beautiful. I'm glad it's not me. Because it was cold Saturday morning. 
man, we went straight from like nice warm weather to I think there's frost on my eyelashes. But um, it's just wonderful. I, I love seeing um, our teens um, in action. I love your, your prayers for them. Simple things like them getting to go youth bucks jobs, do youth bucks jobs, and at those jobs, getting to meet new people and finding out that there's a connection, that there is um, a desire to serve both ways, right? In doing the job and offering the job. Um, there's just so many ways that we get to disciple and have those opportunities in our families, in our church. So thank you for taking those on. <clears throat> I know my folks, I get to, since I get to speak this morning, I'm going to take a minute and embarrass them a little bit and also thank them a little bit. Um, to be able to do ministry with your family, with your, your parents, is a huge blessing. Um, I got to see them almost every summer um, for 30 plus years, and uh, it was a real joy getting to watch them work. So I figured out a few things. They drove over 180,000 miles back and forth to camp. 6,000 campers just at our camps over 29 years, 20,000 plus campers altogether, and the majority of our camps, Pops was driving bus for, and they all were transported safely. The bus, not always, but the kids, yes. Um, over 60 toilets replaced. That's ministry, people. <laughs> Just ask. All right. Over 20 power outages, some of them for almost a week. Try running a camp with no power and not knowing if the water's going to work. I mean, ask the kitchen crew. It's not stressful at all. Not at all. All right. Over 50 trees that came down in windstorms that landed on buildings or vehicles. So there's your ministry, right? You're up at camp and you're like, oh, this is an easy week. Oh, microburst. There's a tree through the top of the mess hall. That's okay. Um, evacuations for fire. 300 plus work projects completed. Three new buildings, multiple additions. Over 20 bears that they had to run off multiple different times. We have bear-proof trash cans that somehow the bears get into. When you wake up in the morning and your, your metal trash can has a hole in it, like either the teens didn't get enough supper or they are. Um, three times that the well exploded. If the water isn't adjusted just right or if there's a power outage and the well comes back on again and all that pressure, I learned this one firsthand, I heard like a, a gentle from the other side of the camp and I opened, our, our well house is pretty big, like from the stairs over there, oh, to me, there's the well over there, and there's two rooms. I opened the door to the well house <clears throat> and got shot by a fire hose that was about this big, right in the chest, just <laughs> and I'm screaming, and the folks' trailer is on the other side of camp, so I'm yelling, Dad! Jack! And of course, everybody in the trailers along the line thought somebody had died. But no, it was just me overreacting. But then, you know, there was a good three or four inches of water in the well house, and, and Dad's like, you're going to have to turn the breaker off. Where's the breaker? In there. <laughs> All right, Lord, I'm going to go stand in this puddle and break a, grab this huge breaker. Whoo! Multiple fridge and freezer outages. That's always fun during the middle of a camp. Um, over 60 water samples taken. So they have to do this three times a summer, and then they get to go deal with the government. That's fun. Um, 30 plus, plus years of, of ministering, not only to our campers, but to rental staffs, to the, to the Forest Service, making um, relationships with the Forest Service, then having to deal with directors, being directors, program directors, managers. I, I'm just, I'm in awe of, of our different people that do ministry. Um, my folks up at camp, and then I get to work with people like Fred and Candy Harris, that are ministers that are here off of the mission field and still doing missions. Um, with, uh, with Winston Tilsey, he comes up to camp and shares his, his gifts. Um, when parents come and they spend time on a hiking trip with teens on their off time on the weekend, it's not just these big things, right? It's all the small things that add up to you guys doing ministry, and I cannot thank you enough because this, we have this body of believers that the teens are encouraged, that you're encouraged, that parents are encouraged, because we love. And I thank you for that. This morning we get to look at something, I had a title for it that's a little odd, or I have a title for it that's a little odd, a storage shed or God's temple. Those are slightly different. A storage shed or God's temple. 
So we're going to be in, in um, 2 Chronicles 29, and we're going to be looking at the life of, of Hezekiah. <clears throat> and uh, I was just talking with Pastor Brett earlier. It's one of those deals I, I love digging into Scripture. The problem is, is you find too much stuff. You don't know what to, to weed out to make sure you, you get just the right stuff, because all the stuff is just the right stuff. But what we're shooting for this morning is knowledge, so I want you guys to get something in your head, something that your hands can do, like an actual application that we can do with God's word, but also a heart change. If, if we don't have a heart change, nothing happens. I, I, I love seeing this in my own kids, right? You can tell them to do something over and over and over, order them to do something, and it's a good thing that you're ordering them to do these things, clean their rooms, do the dishes, um, you know, whatever, but until they desire to do it on their own, until there's a heart change, it's just an order. So head, heart, and hands. So in 2 Chronicles 29, we run into a guy named Hezekiah. Um, what was fun is digging into this, and I, I looked up the, the Hebrew, and I don't have a clue how to pronounce this. I asked Bob Thompson this morning. He, he did an excellent job, and I'm never going to be able to repeat it. So this is how it's spelled. Y-E-K-H-I-Z-Q-I-Y-Y-A-H-U. Whoa! Put that on the back of a football jersey, right? What? But it means that Yah, or God, makes strong. Hezekiah is Yah, or God, makes strong. So we're going we're gonna to dive in here. You realize that people in Scripture are real people. We might read these stories over and over and over again, and you're like, Adam and Eve, I've heard that story a million times. Noah, I've heard that story. Hezekiah, Josiah, I've heard that story a million times. These are real people, so if we can plunk ourselves into their situation a little bit, when we do our morning devos with our kids, we read our story, and it says, imagine you were there. Put yourself in their shoes. As parents, our job, Deuteronomy 6, um, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and then it goes into an explanation of what we should do. When you come in, when you go out, when you're sitting, when you're standing, when you're, when you're in your house, when you're outside, teach your children how to walk in, not my ways, but in God's ways. And we can teach them verbally, but they're going to learn a lot more with how we walk in God's ways, by clothing ourselves in Christ, adorning the gospel. So here's Hezekiah. His dad was a lovely individual named Ahaz. Okay, in this time, the kingdom has been split into two. There's Israel and there's Judah. Can anybody just shout out, how many good kings were there in Israel during the entire kingdom time? Zero. None. None. How many in the, in the, in the southern kingdom in Judah? Nine. Nine good kings. But thank you. Okay, nine good kings, or at least they were considered, some of them were like, eh, you, you kind of made it. But nine good kings. Ahaz was not one of them in Judah, in the southern kingdom. Ahaz, when you read his story in chapter 28 of 2 Chronicles, he not only went an evil direction, but he did everything in his power to take the nation that way. And he reigned for what, uh, I think it was 15 years. And his son is Hezekiah. If there's somebody that should have been seriously messed up by his parents' example, it should have been Hezekiah. In the, in the valley, in the Kidron Valley, so we've had an opportunity to go to Israel, and Jerusalem sits up on a hill, and then there, you, you hear valley, it's called the Kidron Valley. It's about as wide as going from that wall to the edge of our parking lot, so it's kind of shocking. You get there and you're like, this is the Kidron Valley? Okay. But that close to the temple, it says that Ahaz sacrificed one of his sons in the fire to one of the evil gods, to Molech. So what this is, is they would put their children in these molten arms, these metal arms. They would start a fire, and the child would be alive, and the fire would be going, and then they would drop the child into flames. That was his sacrifice. Hezekiah had this guy as a dad. It said that he went around Jerusalem, and he, he shut the gates or the doors of the temple. It means that he barred them shut, he nailed them shut, he made sure that nobody could get into the temple. Okay? So for 15 years, um, it got so bad that the king of Assyria came and um, captured 200,000, well, no, not just the king of Assyria, the, the Israelites as well, the kings of Israel, captured 200,000 people from Judah and hauled them into captivity. 
And then somebody in Israel goes, this is a bad idea, we should send them back. We're already in the bad graces of God. We should let them go and let them go back. Okay, let's let them go back. And they send them back, and they're here, they come back, and Ahaz doesn't give glory to God. He goes, I think I'll set up um, idols to the Assyrian kings who beat us because they must be pretty good. And he went purposely around Jerusalem, and the way it works is when you enter a city, you have to sacrifice to the main god to be allowed to enter the city, and Ahaz has rule. So he would set up altars all over the city, and if you didn't worship there, you would be executed, killed, or shunned from the city, and you couldn't do market work. So this is what Hezekiah grows up seeing this because we see in 29, Hezekiah was not young when he became king. Chapter 29, verse 1, 25 years old when he became king of Judah. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother, here we're going to get some interesting insight as well, was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. So then Hezekiah, we find out, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done, or his father David has done. Abijah is his mom. So if you guys, it's a fun Bible study. You go through and you look at the kings and who's mentioned, their mom and their dad. So it's either the king did evil in the eyes of the Lord and he followed in the ways of his father, or his mom led him astray. But it's still his responsibility, his personal responsibility. Just as Hezekiah, he had a terrible example in a father, but his mother was the daughter of Zechariah, who was the spiritual advisor to Uzziah, who was also a good king. So here's somebody that's an influence in his life. At 25, she must have been an incredible spiritual guide for him because he kicks things off. Great. In the very first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah, it says that he, he had to, the understanding that I got from the, the, the text was he had to rip open, get the doors of the temple to open. Okay, this is where I get the, the title, God's storage shed or his tabernacle or his temple. The temple is there. Solomon built it, beautiful temple, up on a hill, shining, gold covers the doors, beautiful building. People look at it and go, that's where the presence of God is. Sacrifices are made there. You can go there, a priest um, will go on your behalf as an intercessor before God. That's where we can go. In the short reign of, of Ahaz and different other kings, but in Ahaz is what we're going to focus on, it says he made it into a dumping ground. We're going to read in the passage here, the priests come in, and it says they had to remove, it took them eight days just to clear the porch. They opened the doors of the temple, and it took them eight days just to get all, and it calls it defilement. And that, that said, it, it covers everything in, in what I studied. It goes from human refuse to just junk and trash. I'm pretty sure that wasn't like everybody just goes, hey, let's go fill the temple with trash one day. It's a process, right? How does God's place, God's, God's temple, become a dumping ground? But Hezekiah looks at it and he goes, something's not right here. He reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord and he repaired them. He summoned the priests and the Levites to meet him at the courtyard of the temple. All right. He brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square to the east and said to them, Hear me, Levites. Now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of our fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. That's not a good combination, filth and holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what is evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. They also shut the doors of the vestibule, put out the lamps, and have not burned incense or offered burnt offering in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, there's wrath. The wrath of the Lord came on Judah and Jerusalem, and he made them an object of horror, of astonishment, of hissing, and as you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword. Our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. I just told you, 200,000 were taken into captivity by their neighbors, the Israelites, their brothers in the north. Um, now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, in order that his fierce anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not now be neg negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him, to be his ministers, to make offerings for him. Then the Levites arose and consecrated themselves. We're looking at what it looks like to clean out filth, to consecrate ourselves, 
or consecrate, and then repair. So some work had to be done. The temple was defiled. It took them eight days to get from the doors in through the porch. It took them another eight days to cleanse the temple. 16 plus days, and it said they piled all the stuff out in the courtyard, and then they had to haul it out to the Kidron Valley and get rid of it. This is all very public, right? And the people are seeing this happen. So as they're doing this, people are watching and going, Hezekiah, let's see if he does the same thing his dad does. Is he going to lead in in God's way, or is he going to lead in the way of, of evil? And it all starts to add on to each other. Hezekiah leads, and he orders people to do certain things, but we're going to see a transition here. He orders the Levites to consecrate themselves. Can you imagine the shame? And it it says, we're going to read it ahead here, and it says the Levites felt shame. They were ashamed because the people go, our priests have to consecrate themselves. What have you been doing? Why haven't you been leading and leading well? The Levites come and publicly consecrate themselves and cleanse themselves so that they can go clean the temple. Then they have to consecrate themselves so that they can give the, the sacrifice and the offering. They do all this very publicly, and they're watching. Now, all of this, remember, 200,000 were hauled into captivity in Israel. They don't like Israel. There's been nothing but war between the two of them. We're going to skip ahead a little bit here. Now, the rededication of the temple, we're in verse 18. Verse 18. Then they went to Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord. The altar, bird offering, and all its utensils, and a table for the showbread, and all its utensils, all the utensils that King Ahaz discarded in his reign while he was faithless, your dad, while he took everything out of the temple and chucked it, we have made ready and consecrated, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. Then Hezekiah the king rose early, gathered the officials of the city, and went up to the house of the Lord. They brought a lot of animals and shed a lot of blood. (laughs) So again, why do you think God does that? Why would he publicly go, there's something that's pretty rough that's going to happen. An innocent lamb, beautiful livestock, lives are going to be taken and blood is going to be shed for a sacrifice for the sins that have happened. It's a pretty brutal visual, right? And they're doing it by the thousands. It says, as, as you read on, there wasn't enough Levites to handle all of the sacrifices that were required. So they actually had to call other people and they're like, get in here. We got to consecrate you because there's not enough of us because there's so many people that are now recognizing because of what the king has done for us and the Levites have done for us and the cleansing of the temple, they're starting to realize, ah, it's not just the king that needs to turn back. It's not just the Levites that need to turn back. It's me. And they come in the droves, by the droves, they come to be cleansed. As we get further along in chapter 30, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit so that we can get through this because I want to see you guys, I'm going to get this to the main point here. It says the preparations for the Passover. King Hezekiah, he went and he sent word, not just to Judah, but he sends word to Israel as well. Why Israel? They're the jerks. They're the ones that haven't been following God. And then it says that his messengers were mocked along the way. But some people who had contrite hearts and soft hearts, listened and came all the way from Manasseh and Dan, way up in the north. They traveled through Israel, where they would be mocked as well, and made it all the way down to Jerusalem to come to the Passover. And what's really interesting about the Passover itself is it's supposed to be followed or done on a certain day. And Hezekiah prays and he goes, hey, they're not here yet, Lord. These people that that have taken us into captivity that we don't like, that have been evil to us, they're not here yet. We want them to enjoy the Passover. So let's, can we wait for them? And instead of God going, nope, it's got to be done on a certain day, he goes, yes, people are important to me. Wait for them. And they do the Passover on a different day so that they can all get there. And then they get there, and um, the celebration of the Passover, this is where it's a wonderful tie-in. Pastor Brett's been taking us through the book of Acts, And as Paul and Silas and as Paul and Barnabas and Saul and Barnabas, they go out to the Gentiles. Um, When Peter was given the the three sheets come down and he goes to, um, to, to visit with the Gentile, what was the response of most of the Jews? They're like, those people are disgusting. We don't eat what they eat. We don't do what they do. We don't hang out with them. 
We don't have a different God in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, here's Hezekiah, and he goes, bring those people in. And what's really cool, the priests were on board too, because here comes all these people, and they're like, you are so unclean. All of you Israelites, all you people from Judah that have not been following God, you are so unclean. We'll consecrate more Levites, and we'll take your place. We will go in substitution for you and be cleansed for you. Couldn't they have just looked at them and gone, you took my, my mom, my wife into captivity. You killed our people. But instead they said, I will make a sacrifice for you and go in your place and be right. And they, they pray before God and God goes, I like what you're doing. I like what you're doing. That is a contrite and a humble heart. People have been evil to you. And what is your reaction? We want to serve them and welcome them into the house of the Lord. What a wonderful way to big, begin reform, right? October 31st is, is Reformation Day. You guys teach your kids about what Reformation is? That's a wonderful time of discipleship right there. Why was the church, why, what was reform? The authority of Scripture, sola scriptura, right? We talked about this before, the 500-year anniversary of the Reformation. Wonderful opportunities for you to get an understanding of, of church history and teach your kids and dive into it. On Wednesday nights, we've been going through church history in a year. I love history. And we read about different people throughout church history on that day in whatever year it was. So September 25th, on Wednesday night, we read about a gentleman named John Newcastle, Old Castle, John Oldcastle. And he was a buddy of Wycliffe. And he was a common man, and he married a noble, and so he got into the House of Lords in England. His best friend growing up was the Prince of Wales. Somehow they met through some weird circumstance um, out in a field somewhere. Became King Henry V. And John Newcastle, from the parliament, started preaching the gospel from scripture. And they were like, you can't do that. You're, you're usurping the authority of the church. And he goes, no, God wants all to come to him. Sinners, people that think they're saints, all to come to him. Um, it's just this amazing story of how his kids were inspired by him. Um, a generation was inspired by him. They, the, the church at the time came and said, you have to be quiet and he was put on trial, a lot like Martin Luther, and um, he said at his trial, God's word, first, foremost, and most in my life, all in my life. I cannot do anything but what God would have me do. I can't be quiet. So they put him in the Tower of London. He escaped. He went out and preached the gospel some more. He wasn't quiet, just like Paul, right? Just like getting Peter out of the, out of the prison. Oh, man, I'm out. Let's preach some more. And then they burn him at the stake and send body all over England, and it, boom, big old uh, revival happens. Love it. But that's church history, right? And we, we, we tie this in. This is Hezekiah. This is a human being that had a terrible dad, a faithful mom, a, a horrible problem of a temple that had been defiled, people that weren't real jazzed with their neighbors to the north, and look what God does whenever we are faithful to following his word and his direction. He organized the priests. The people came from Israel. They came from Judah. There was a revival in the land and they turned back. But what's sad is that at the death of Hezekiah, Manasseh takes over, and his son Manasseh became the next king in chapter 33. And Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. He ruled in Jerusalem for 55 years, and here it is. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the despair despicable, detestable practices of the pagan religions, the pagan nations. What happened? His dad was amazing, but each of us is responsible. 55 years, and then we get Josiah, and a wonderful turning back to the Lord. It's that as a parent, as, a, as an individual, um, I heard this at a funeral one time, it's that, you know, from 19, whatever, 50, to 2010 on a gravestone, and there's this little tiny line in the middle. That little tiny line was, he did right in the eyes of the Lord, or he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. What does that little tiny line on your tombstone represent? I pray that it is a contrite heart, a humble heart. Isaiah 66 too. I'm going to read Isaiah 66. It's just this amazing passage. Isaiah 66. And you're going to see Isaiah 66 too as we're reading. And this is what we're shooting for. And uh, there's nothing that's going to be easy. 
The humble and contrite in spirit, Isaiah 66. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? So if we're looking at a storage shed or God's temple, God doesn't look at it and go, oh, it's toast, I'm done, it's full of trash, I can't be God anymore. He goes, no, my dwelling place will be with you. Do you want me there? Or do you just fill up who I am in your life with trash? Or do you purpose? It's hard work, right, to cleanse the temple. But God is with us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. It's hard work to consecrate ourselves, to get ourselves right, and to to get rid of sin that's in our lives, to purify ourselves, and to recognize I get to be a witness to somebody, to my kids, to to my fellow believers. But thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and does what? Trembles at my word. Oh, the word of God. In Josiah's reign. The story behind that one is incredible. Josiah starts at eight years old. Eight years old. That's a great mom and and leadership right there because she raises him up. He has co-regents that raise him up in a good way. By the time he is... He's, uh, I think it's 16 or 18, I got the dates wrong there. But within 10 to 12 years, he takes on serious reforms in Israel. He goes out and he burns down the Asherah poles, tear down the al- tears down altars, goes in and gets bones and sprinkles them on high places so they'll be desecrated for the pagan rites. And then he goes, hey, the temple, we need to get the temple right. And they have to do this all over again because 55 years of abuse has happened again. And they go and they cleanse the temple And then one of the priests comes to him and he says, we found a book. And then this is what happens. Josiah looks at it. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles or loves my word. We found a book. Oh, it was in the temple? Guess what Josiah says? Read it. They open it up and they read it. And what's Josiah's reaction? Is it, eh, just the word of God. He's on his knees he is it's like, get everybody here. Get the nation of Israel here. This is why we get together on a Sunday, right? Hebrews, it says, don't forsake meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but come and encourage each other, spur one another towards love and good deeds, even more so as we see the day approaching. So we come and we encourage one another in God's word. And there's, there's Josiah and he's like, get the, the whole nation of Israel here. Get the parents, get the kids, get the grandparents. We've got to hear from God's word blessings on those that follow his directions. And it's not God that brings the wrath. It's our sin that brings death on us when we don't. And Josiah's like, we have got to get in God's word. We have got to. Here's a quote from a a thinker that definitely applies to us. It's from Aristotle. But excellence, did you get that one? There we go. Lovely. There's a self-portrait. Um, Excellence is never an accident. It is always the result of high intention, but you, have to, you can't just have good intentions. Sincere effort, intelligent execution, it represents the ch- wise choice of many, 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 many alternatives. Choice, not chance, determines your destiny. Now again, this is a secular person saying this, but this is <laughs> when we are humble in a contrite heart, when we choose to do the hard things, make a discipleship time in your day if you're a parent. It's not easy. I know we're all busy. Make it happen. It's not easy. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of not every morning getting my kids set up with a discipleship time and time in the Word. But when we do, and what's fun is when your kids are the ones that come and remind you and they're like, Dad, you can't leave for work yet. We haven't done our Bible time yet. Oh, <laughs> yes, we haven't. Thank you for the reminder. But, oh, a humble and contrite heart is one that goes, oh, that's right. We need to spend time in God's word. We get to spend time in God's word. We want to spend time in God's word. Then as a body, it's not just somebody coming up to play the piano. It's, oh, thank you for using the gift that you have. That wasn't a performance. That was a thank you to God for allowing him to play. Thank you to God for those that have given of their time and their talents. Hezekiah's father Ahaz had proposed to lock up the temple and spread evil around the city. His son Hezekiah begins straight away to restore. 
His mother Abijah, daughter of Zechariah, godly influence. Cleaning out the filth, consecrating the priests, repairing the articles, finally reminding the people of the wages of sin throughout sacrifice after sacrifice. Death equals sacrifice, a bloody reminder of the weight of sin. And then the recognition, there's purpose and plan behind this. There's consecration, there's work, there's cleansing by the blood of sacrifice. Then what's amazing is the priests get together and at first, Hezekiah orders them to worship. He says, get your harps, get your lyres, get your drums, get your cymbals. We are going to sing. And he orders them to worship. But what's really cool, and I'm gonna mess up where it's at, but it says that they their hearts changed, and they weren't just ordered to worship, they rejoiced in worship. It was, come and worship. I don't want to. Come and worship. Whoa, look what's happening. Come and worship. Look what God is doing. Come and worship. What is going on? I want that. Sometimes we might not feel like being God's temple, but you never know who you're going to run into. It might be your kid, might be somebody else, I had the opportunity to listen to some testimonies yesterday from two people I greatly admire, and they're sharing about friends from high school and kids in their youth group. One young lady was raised in a, a, he said it was a very spiritual home. The parents were right on track, on fire. Um, uh, The kid was a public school student and was on fire for, for preaching the word in her school, and then everything fell apart. Her boyfriend went away. Um, It just, things were just falling apart. And she said something to the effect of, I was loved all my life. I knew the love of God. But then I experienced the loss of what I thought love was. And then the only thing I had left to embrace was the true authority of God and the love of God. And that's whenever I became a follower of Christ. Independent understanding of who God was in her life. And then the other story was um, multiple individuals that were raised in a terrible background or home life and they knew what they were being saved from, right? They said, oh, this is what God is bringing me to. He is taking all the trash out and making me his temple. Oh, I'm so, and then it's a life of, I don't want to go back to that trash. This is my God. He is the one that's made me this temple. We get to, uh, we get to I get to watch so many different ways where the, the kids interact. Um, we get to teach Launchpad at Valley View, or at Caldwell right now. And um, we have kids that are saved, kids that are unsaved. Um, and it, it boggles my mind. I shouldn't, right? It shouldn't. But the questions they ask. And God puts you in places for his design. One young lady came into class and started the class with, um, should I date an unbeliever? I'm like, really? We want to go there? I'll go there. We're going to go to scripture. And here's what God says about unequally yoked, right? All the other kids are listening in. I had a plan of what class was going to be that day, and it turned into something completely different. At the end of class, that young lady said, I don't think I'm going to date an unbeliever. I was like, where'd you come up with that? She goes, I don't think God would want me to. Not just Nate? No, I don't think God would want me to. I don't think that's a good idea. I was like, that's a good heart right there. It's a good heart. Another day, a young man comes in, and he goes, so what's it mean? How do you you become a Christian? I want to become a Christian. I was like, where'd that come from? He goes, I've been thinking about it a lot lately, and I want to do it. What's it take? I didn't do any of the work. Somebody else planted all those seeds, and he had that heart that day to come in and ask those questions. I got to teach at um, Greenleaf at a middle school retreat, and a young lady came up and said, my home life has been so rough. I'm a teenager, and, um, and I was almost sold into slavery. And she said, my mom got me out of that situation, and I'm here because of God's protection and I want God in my life. What do I do? What do you do with that? That's not something that you wake up every morning and go, yeah, simple conversation. But God puts you there. Oh, what a wonderful time. I got to pray with her. I've seen her a couple times since at different chapels. God is so good. From scared to a smile on her face to joy. God is so good. He took a, a, a What she thought was a storage shed. She thought, I'm wasted. I'm trashed. And God goes, no, you are my temple. The kids have been doing um, uh, Awana verses. Oh, no, I left my Awana verses. Anyway, um, John 14, I believe, is one of them. And it's it's God's promise. There it is. 
Thank you, Shane. John 14, 16 and 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him. He dwells with you and will be in you. Amen? That's a verse that our Awana kids are learning. I was like, yes, that's the Holy Spirit. You are the dwelling place of God. A humble and contrite heart, that's where God lives. That's, That's where he dwells. That's where he works. And he is the God of the universe. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. That's my God. We have an amazing God. And he works through ridiculous circumstances too. Um, I had the opportunity to see how well an airbag worked the other day. That's how I felt. Yeah, My nose is straighter now though, so that's a plus. Um, I had my glasses on and uh, somebody pulled out in front of me in a very nice but very solid 1999 Chevy Blazer. And I was in my little Mini Cooper. Mini Coopers fit under Chevy Blazers. So, pulled out, and I have large feet, and I should have realized this because the pedals are small, and I shoved my foot on the clutch, and I shoved my foot on the brake, and my foot was underneath the the brake. So I was like, and I couldn't stop fast enough, and went right underneath the bumper of this vehicle that came out in front of me. Minis are are made really well to just crumple. They just, I mean, the motor mounts came off, the hood crinkled, the airbag blew off, my nose is all jacked up. Just awful. Um, yeah, at least it's straight now, right? But God is working in wonderful ways because the first cop that showed up was just an incredible gentleman. They were, they all were, but he was like, I can see, really, it's all good, nothing, no problem here. Um, but he had to go away on a different call. The second guy came in, got his report from the first cop, handed me the, the police report, and it said on there that there was a misdemeanor. And I was like, wait a second, what? A misdemeanor, what did I do wrong? He goes, well, there's always people that are at fault in an accident. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. did I not hit hard enough? I mean, what? So, so, but God is good. I got to go to a court hearing and I'm sitting at the court and um, the, God was so good. The, the public defender was a wonderful human being, which I've thanked him so much because how do you deal with that day in and day out, people in a court? And I thanked him for his heart. And he goes, I couldn't do it, but for the grace of God. I go, Amen. And he kind of winked at me, and he goes, keep it quiet, it's all good. I was like, oh, I'm keeping that quiet. But he spent 35 to 40 minutes with each individual person that was waiting for the judge, and he personally attended to each one of them to, to, to calm their fears. God set me down next to a young 19-year-old girl that was pregnant, that, had, that was speeding because she thought her water had broke, and the, so the cop pulled her over, and she was in tears. She's like, I think I'm having my baby. And he goes, well, you were speeding. Here's a ticket. Um, I don't think your water broke. I think you're just emotional. And, um, and, she's, and so anyway, she's just over, just super stressed. So she comes in, sits by me. I had no clue what was going on, right? I'm just looking around, looking at everybody, thinking, why am I in court? And then God goes, guess why? And this young lady, all I did was look at her and smile, and she broke down and talked for 20 minutes about her situation. 20 minutes! I didn't get a word in. It's like, wow, you got a lot on your head and heart. And then all I said was, do you mind if I pray for you? And then the public defender and the judge looked back because she was openly bawling, and they're looking at me. What did you do? <laughs> Nothing. But we prayed. She went up. The judge dismissed her ticket. She came back and she was like, did you see that? I was like, yeah, I'm right here in the court. It's all the whole thing. But she was like, God is so good. I I have an interview for a job this morning. I was going to be late if they didn't get this done quickly. I'm going to get there on time. I have, this is just wonderful. God is so good. When she walked in there, she was like, my life is over. I'm not going to get to my job. I'm not going to, I don't, she doesn't know where the father is, he left the equation. And in that moment, I realized, this isn't about me smashing my car. This isn't about me being frustrated and being court. This is about this young lady. God is good. God is good. So whenever we have that humble heart, that change of heart, (laughs) belief put into action, we take the knowledge that God gives us of real people 
dealing with crazy situations that still come and, and bow before God because he is the Lord, that heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool. We are his home. This is the one whom I look to, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles and loves the authority of my word. Praise God. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to come that you, would, that you would show us Christ. Oh, Lord, that, that you, you came and did the unthinkable, Lord. You sacrificed yourself for us. You were the blood atonement. You were the payment for sin. Your Holy Spirit is the one that, that lives in us, that is our intercessor, our encourager, our friend. Father, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to come together this morning as, as young people, as teens, as adults, as mentors, as disciples, as parents, as grandparents. Lord, thank you for the body of Christ. How can we keep but sing your praise, Lord? Amen. Would you stand with us as we finish this morning? Well, here we have Sunday school afterwards. How can I keep from singing? that I, I got all my stuff dropped the judge was very nice so praise God <laughs> God is good oh father thank you so much for today 
Lord, um, it is a privilege and an honor to open your word and to come before your presence. I pray we would not take it lightly. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your, your sacrifice, for your son, and for this opportunity this morning to, to invest in each other's lives. Father, I pray that we would take the time today to ask each other truly, how are you doing? What can I do for you? How can I pray for you and invest in each other's lives? Lord, thank you for this morning in your name. Amen. Please stick around. Sunday school is next.